Well, all right. It's not the skies over Europe. In actual fact, it's the Royal Air Force Museum at Hendon. I want to find out who it was that was flying that other plane. The man's a complete roadhog. He's a skyhog. I actually have come to the conclusion that they must lose more people and pilots getting out of their planes onto the ground than they actually did in the skies. Oh, I've never seen flying like it in my life. Who's going to pay for the damage? I've got bullet holes all over my aeroplane. Ah, Gary Newman, you can pay for the damage of my aeroplane. Why here? What are you doing here? I've got a real passion for aeroplanes. Love anything to do with aeroplanes, especially the older ones. And to me, this is just, uh, it's like seventh heaven to me. You've got your own, haven't you? Yeah, I do. I have, a, I have a, an old World War II aeroplane. Nothing as powerful as this one. Mm. What is think. this? This is called a Typhoon, Yeah. Uh, made by a company called Hawker. So is the principle of flying this plane and your own the same? I want to have a little bit of... <laughs> I'll have to get somebody in that knew it, but essentially, yes, very, very much so. In fact, the aeroplane I've got was the RAF trainer for exactly this kind of aeroplane. You'd go from mine onto this, mm. and, and you would learn about the problems associated with this aeroplane on, on my one, because it does all what this does, just not quite so nastily as this sort of aeroplane would do it. Show me around this instrument panel, then. What have we got in here? Well, this is the airspeed indicator. This is basically uh, just like a speedo in a car, to you how fast you're going. This is the artificial horizon, which tells you which way up you are. If you're in clouds, you can't see the ground, that kind of thing. Top right is the climate descent, which tells you how fast you're going up and down. Bottom left, that tells you how high you are. One in the middle at the bottom says what direction you're going. That's a compass, basically. And the one on the right tells you whether you're, you're, you're turning in, in a balanced turn. It's possible to turn an aeroplane, to not be in balance, but it sort of goes around with a tower dragging mm. or with a tail kicking out, that kind of thing. And this tells you whether you're in balance or not, which is very, very important when you're firing guns, because if the aeroplane is like that and you're looking that way, the bullets are actually going out that Missing way. Missing everything. Yeah, so you must be in balance before you fire, and that's very, very important for a fighting aeroplane. Where did you get this passion for World War II planes? I don't know, really. I, I suppose it's, it, it, it started with an interest in aeroplanes in general, and it went on from there, because this was the last era uh, where I've got like relatives that were involved in the, in the fighting side of it. Mm. And I suppose, really, in some ways, it was the last of the, the aeroplanes where people actually just got in them and flew them, as opposed to plug it into a computer and then flying them, which is very, very clever, and I'm not knocking that at all. Mm. But this was the last of the pure kind of fighting, if there is such a thing, really. Mm. And, and I think it's that, that and the fact that they're within my relative's living memory. When did you start to learn how to fly? Uh, 1978, about a year or so before I... Before the music took off? Yeah, really, yeah, before that. Because a lot of people would think that you decided to throw the ill-gotten gains of the music <laughs> industry into, uh, into flying or, something, yeah. or, or a hobby, yeah. but it's, it's but not I really a hobby, is it? It, no, it's much more than a hobby. It's very much, it's almost like a second career because I do air displays. I do about 25 shows a year with um, a Harvard formation team. And um, it, it really is more than a hobby. It's, um, we get a little bit of money for it, which helps. It doesn't run the airplanes, but it helps to pay for the airplanes and that kind of thing. But don't you worry about your personal safety zapping around in your, in your airplane? Well, I, I've, been, I've been trained and instructed, especially in recent years, by, best, by really some of the best people that are around. Mm. And so I've had excellent training, and providing that I'm careful and fly within my limits, within the aeroplane's limits, and it, and it keeps on working properly, mm -hmm. then I, I should be fine. But, but it is obviously more dangerous than going to the shops. <laughs> really. yeah, just a little bit. I'm, I'm going to get off now. So if you could start it up and take it, just put it over there somewhere. But don't do anything till I've got off, all right? Get a move on. Yeah, all right, but just, I, I'm, I'm nearly off. OK, right, off you go. This is an amazing looking machine. What's this? Is this a Messerschmitt, a 110? Yeah. This was going to be Germany's bigger weapon. It, it turned out to be not particularly good as a fighter. If you're going to be their big fighter, you're going to sort the British out. But it turned out to be not much of a match for the, the, the British fighter. They like the Spitfire and the Hurricane over the back there. So it became a, a night fighter. We were attacking mm. our bombers. We used to fly mainly at night. That's why I had the, what looks like television air on the I thought it was front. a colour television. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually a radar system. And it would use that to track the aeroplanes at night, obviously out, out of sight and uh, close in on them and shoot them down that way. And that, it was very successful. Did it put our chaps at a bit of a disadvantage then? Yeah, very much so, yeah. It was quite deadly. Once they were locked onto you, you really... It was very difficult to get rid of them. Yeah. So I'm told, anyway. <laughs> you mentioned the Spitfire and the Hurricane, which are yes. over here. Yes. Well, everybody knows the Spitfire. A fantastic plane. I love it. What do you know about this? A uh, fair bit. This, this was our main fighter for the whole war period, really, uh, as far as the British-made bomb was concerned. 
It's very, very powerful. It's incredibly good looking, I think, anyway. Very fast. And I think more than any other aeroplane from the Warper, at least, it, it, it stopped the Germans. It, it, and it's very, there's something like 42 or 44 variations of it throughout the war to keep updating it, you know, to meet, to meet what the enemy were doing. Mm. I, I love this. This is my favourite of all, actually. Main adversary to this, so the, the, its main opponent really was a Messerschmitt 109. And this is it. It looks a mean one. Yeah, very purposeful. This is a good aeroplane. But this was the main German fighter really throughout the war, much as our Spitfire was for us. And it went hand in hand with the Spitfire. It progressed and they leapfrogged over each other. And this had the advantage sometimes than the Spitfire did. But this really was the main one. It's a very, very impressive fighting machine. Why has it got a yellow nose? <laughs> I'm not really sure with the Germans. I know I, I uh, got a model of an American aeroplane during the war, and the yellow nose on that meant that it was a, a squ I think it was a squadron leader or a wing commander's aeroplane, not the, the boss. Mm. And whether it means the same thing for the Germans or not, I don't know. I, I would presume so. They certainly did it during the, the First World War. They, they would mark their leaders' aeroplanes up in a certain way. So they put the squadron leader in the plane that's easiest to spot and shoot down. Yeah, it's true. unfair, if yeah. you ask me. <laughs> Um, did you say that they were quite difficult to land as well? Yeah, the whole th at one point in the war they were losing more of these aeroplanes through landing accidents than they were through, through the enemy, us. Really, very, very tricky to fly, very, very small tail area, very, very difficult to land, to keep straight. They would just have a tendency to just whip around mm -hmm. and face from whence they came. And that would take out all the undercarriage and really mess them about a bit. You've obviously got quite a comprehensive knowledge of, of World War II aeroplanes. Don't you find that in the early days people didn't take you particularly seriously because of the sort of music. Yeah, yeah, very much so. I, I also run, run foul of the press. I, had a, I, I was in an aeroplane, I had an accident once. I wasn't flying it, though they said I was. And really because of that, since then, I've had no end of uh, Mickey taking and things to do with it, which is a little bit annoying because when you, when you sort of get to a certain stage with it and nobody's taken any interest, and yet when you, you've only got to dent one and they crawl all over you to have a go at you. That, that, that does annoy you a little bit, it annoys me anyway. So what's your relationship between the music industry and your flying? I try to keep the two completely separate. I've got the music business there, which is very sort of makeup and lights and very pretty and showing off and doing all the bit. And then you have the flying on the other side, which is much more, I don't know how to put it really, it's much more like real life, because if you make a mistake, then you, you a good chance of dying, you know, it's, it's quite a serious sort of hobby, really. Mm. Especially when you get to, to this kind of level with it. So if you were in a plane, say a 747 going across the Atlantic, yeah. going to do a tour in the States, and all of a sudden the pilot comes over all unnecessary, and they say, is, is there a, a pilot on the plane, you'd be able to fly a 747, would you? I've, I've been lucky enough to have a go on, on the simulators of those, and, and I could do that, yeah, I, thought I could take over and probably if I was talked through it, I could get it down. Because I actually have done those simulators and, and done it successfully, got away with it. But uh, I wouldn't, I, in no way could I understand the airplane and understand all the systems because it's, you know, it's incredibly complex and yeah. very, very skillful thing to do. But yeah. I could, the, the basic flying of it is very similar, yes. Well, if you reckon you could fly it, follow me because I've got a bit of a challenge for you. Come on, oh, I'm going to have a look at this. Well, Gary, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. A bit of a treat for you now. I thought you might like to ride home in this one. Unfortunately, I couldn't get you a ladder. That'd be tricky getting it out. I'll give you a leg up. Yeah. Right? Is that all right? Oh, I'll give you a go. <laughs> 